and then using it against my experience really of what I know it to have been like yeah. before all this. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, no, we're, 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 we're going to start now. Right? So we're, we're, we're on now. Um, no, I, I know what you mean. Uh, like, all, I've, all, all I've got to go off, when you talk about the health service, is my own personal experience as a, a customer of the health service, if you want to call it that, right? And then like you say, like you sort of alluded to the anecdotal, like uh, anecdotal uh, experiences from, from other people telling you about it. But the difference is, well, the main difference is between uh, between me listening to those experiences and you listening to those experiences. You like you've been there. You've worked in hospitals for fifteen years plus, yeah. Yeah. Uh, NHS hospitals fifteen years plus, and so uh, uh, it's, it's a bit like military a military person talking to a mil- talking spinning an anecdote to a military person as opposed to spinning an anecdote to a civilian. Yes, explained in different ways, understood in different ways, and you can almost be explained in more in depth to a person who you know has been there, and you can, you yeah. can more. Um, I I struggle to understand what's going on, to be honest, whether we're in a worse off position or, or not. And well, not or not, we are in a bad position. It's, it's like a question. I think one of the questions is why and how how bad is it? Uh, and it seems pretty bad to me. So yeah. But, well, from, what, what, how would you see it? Then? Yeah, from what it sounds, it sounds like the worst it's ever been. Um, so just some of the, so I can only account for what, you know, other n- doctors and nurses are sharing that is happening. The things like the saying with people being triaged in car parks, I can all compare that to my experience when I was working and that never happened. Like I've never heard of that. Um, so to me, that is right. That is the worst because I've never heard of people being triaged in car parks before. Um, that's just completely unheard of. But how does the situation like come about? Like, what what's missing in the system for that to be happening now? That I would say is an overload of patients. Um, that because when I was um, working as an agency nurse, A and E agency nurse, it was still quite common for a and e to be quite busy and i worked for like a high rate agency where it was the last agency that people went to um meaning they'd they'd already gone within the system to get their own staff to cover then they'd gone into their own banking system so getting the rest of people around the trust to see if they could cover and perhaps even other agencies and if they hadn't managed to get staff then they went to the agency I was working for um it's like a last minute thing so I it, I was always by the time I got to a shift I said yeah I can do a shift it had already started um and I was just there to cover and I was turning up and you would see like you know ambulances queuing up um corridors full so, so it, it's kind of it it's always been quite chaotic (laughs) um and some days I would walk in and I would think this just looks like a war zone and that was pre-pandemic um and that that is just to like the sheer volume of people coming in and just not having enough like space and and then there's staffing issues as well um one of the hospitals I worked at I, I used to do night shifts there regular it was covered like almost entirely by agency staff on one of the night shifts because they were that short of nurses so one of the things i i, I read about yesterday was so you mentioned that obviously we got the car park so the car park you know, triage in the car park and the way i think of that is either that either there's been a massive uptick in the, in the, the number of patients needed to be admitted to hospital right or uh or there's been a, a, a reduced uh, resource availability in the hospital for whatever reason. They've gone from 100% to, I don't know, 70% bed availability, right? I don't know. I don't know if that's the case. One of the things I was reading about yesterday is that is, there's, over the last five years or more, there's been a big reduction, as in a 50% reduction, in the number of district nurses that, uh, that uh, district, yeah, district nurses, there's just been a 50% reduction of district nurses. And, the reason that that 
point was raised is that it's, it's a contributing factor to the reason there's so many people uh, being uh, being sent to hospital, being dealt with at hospitals, and that is because. One of the key roles that I want you to correct me on this, or I'll explain in more detail. One of the one of the key uh, contributions that district nurses bring to the the end to end process of person thinks they need help, uh, you know, medical help, emergency or not, uh, or not emergency, to them going to hospital. It's one of the things the district nurses is they're an early point in the triage system, so a district nurse can deal with things, deal with with patients who don't. Necessary. They can identify patients who don't necessarily need to go to hospital, and they yeah. can identify that and deal with it. Not, and then that those don't end up going to hospital, so don't get overwhelmed. And with a fifty percent reduction in the district nurses, that has resulted in less people being able to be triaged pre-hospital. So they go they go to the hospital to be triaged. So there's people at the hospital that don't necessarily be, need to be there. They don't know. So are you aware? Or like what? How, what does that sound like to you? Yeah. No, that sounds right. Um, this is where I think there's for this problem there's there's no like one i don't think there's one answer or it's it's lots of little things that have that have compounded it um within like within the nhs system like the staffing um overload of patients and then like you say what with the district nurses um you know gps what's um like social care funding so getting people out of hospital that don't need to that are in a bed that don't need to be there anymore and getting them into, um, you know, like care homes or having a care package started, there's problems there as well. Um, so it, I think, yeah, it's all, it all contributes because I only know from a district nurse and I only did that as um, a student nurse, but I, I do remember, yeah, there was, if that, there was points where you would go to maybe just give some eardrops um, but they might pick up on something else. Like they might, have, you know, complain about, oh, I've been getting a little bit of niggle in my chest. Like, well, do you think you should go see your doctor? And how you could, they could do, like you say, an, an assessment then, whether or not, or do they need to go to hospital? Or do they need to make a doctor's appointment? And then they might get a doctor's appointment. And that, yeah, it's like that early intervention. And if that's not there, this is what I also think. I think as well, less people maybe have wanted to go to hospital because of the pandemic and so I think certain problems they might have where they might have gone early on to get them resolved I, th I think maybe there's been a build-up um where they've just not gone to seek help until it's you know at its worst maybe yeah I've heard that a lot I've heard that a lot um in fact on the on the previous podcast of this was with a, was with a lady called uh, Liz McConaughey uh a uh, Chinook crew, she was on the Chinook crew for ages and, and she had a like real bad mental health during the pandemic and one of the, one of the things she mentioned was that during that during the pandemic she didn't want to go and burden the system with how she was at the time like with with her with her with with being ill she didn't want to go and burden the system with how she was because it was she felt there was so much going on and it sort of and it compounded the issue but yeah. she had because of it um and, and, and I understand that. I think I think the 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 waiting lists have doubled from there was I think there were three million pre-pandemic twenty January twenty twenty one maybe, and I think they're at six million now, are they? Yeah, um, yeah. I don't know the exact figure, and yeah, I think everything that was put on hold is just being compounded as well. I know those like cancer patients. I think there was like. 600,000 cancer patients that miss treatment or were waiting for treatment and you've just got to think they're just going to get sicker and then it, yeah I think it just compounds everything. Is there a manning issue? Are you hearing that there's an, there is actually a manning issue? Like are, are, yeah. are there jobs being advertised that they can't fill? Yeah so the <laughs> Yeah, so I th I think I figure I saw it was like the I don't know if it's the hundred and thirty thousand nurses shot, but um, but I mean this has been an issue since I day one as a student nurse <laughs> in in two thousand and two. Um, oh really? Because yeah. because the way it's been painted by a lot of people is Alice is a Brexit issue, and we lost so, a lot of overseas workers who fill in the positions. I think from a from a nursing perspective, staffing has always been an issue. I I just it was just a com like the first thing I was told um, that I remember being told on my first placement was don't expect a break because you won't get one. 
and then that just became like just common nature it was like right I'm not if you get a break you're lucky um, and that was the case for like most places that you worked and the majority of places you worked it was extremely common to go on to shift and be like oh we're short staffed we're short staffed today and then as a student nurse you were you're meant to be not included in the numbers and um, and often we were included in the numbers we were used as like healthcare assistants and um, so that was in 2002 and then it's just I think the staffing issue has always been an issue I don't think I've ever been anywhere that's been yet yeah, but really happy and content with our staffing levels yeah so, so with your would it be unpaid overtime stuff like that you'd have to um so it's more just it's having the number of staff for the workload on like on a particular one and not being able to fill the spaces so but one issue i saw on one of the wards that they had was they were using agency so they had a, a big chunk of money to have they were advertising for like a full-time staff nurse and that was like x amount but they couldn't then use that money because they'd started eating into that money to pay for the agency while they were waiting to post someone <laughs> so it was like this vicious cycle where it's like well we, we don't have the money for a full-time staff nurse now so now we're having to use agency um, so, so why uh why would people work for the agency and not the nhs hey. um so yeah so the reason i went for agency was was money um yeah the 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 pay ranges from, I don't know, 20 to say like 50 pounds an hour. The agency I worked for was like the, the top rate agency and that's why I went. And you, and that was work, and that, but that was working in NHS, NHS office doing that. Yeah, and it, yeah. It's crazy, isn't it? It's crazy. It's absolute madness. Um, Cause you see a similar thing sometimes in, you see a similar thing sometimes in this, like in the corporate world, where as opposed to bringing an employee on for a short, for like a six month or a twelve month project, for example, they'll go and pay, they'll go and pay, uh, they'll pay an agency for a, 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 a someone of a, a similar skills skill set. They pay through the teeth for it. They'll pay like yeah. two or three times more than they would have paid the pay the employee. But it's like a net, it's like a net gain in the short term for the company. They haven't got to commit to, you know, uh, a. a, a, a probation period and the 12 month contract and and private health or whatever else they offer but in the long term it's really short-sighted especially in something like the nhs um uh but what i don't understand is in that situation it's like why if you go if, it's, if, the, if the issue's been going on for that for that long the nhs are obviously paying through the teeth for staff they could have i mean how, what did you do 15 years working in nhs hospitals yeah. 70, 70 years. You did, and a couple of years of that was agency, right? Agency and yeah, I worked as um, a resuscitation trainer as well. So that was like my day job. And then I would do agency on like the odd weekends. Um, and then through, and then when I, I had my children, went back to work for a little bit doing ag just agency. Um, but that, that was again, because the pay, because of childcare was so expensive, it, but it, agency was more attractive in that sense because it meant I could do one night shift on a weekend and get the same amount of money as I would in my previous job for five days oh that's interesting so it was like well I don't have to pay for childcare I can do a Friday night shift and get the same amount of money that's so that was my logic so sort of sort of what can we draw from that is what you're saying is that in in nursing or in the health profession, which is heavily, heavily leans towards more women doing it than, than men for whatever reason. And more women are, uh, uh, look after the kids than what men do for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, then it it makes it, so an agency provides a way to work in the health service without and be able to manage the childcare side of things at the same time and afford it at the same time. Whereas working in NHS full time maybe would, is that what you're saying there? Yeah, yeah. So with so yeah, I had um <clears throat> yeah, so I had a partner then. So yeah, but as a I'd say as like a single parent, it's difficult to do. I don't do it now because 
just getting cover for shifts is like impossible. Um, but from, uh, yeah, when I was in a relationship, so, so like he would work from Monday to Friday, I'd stay at home, he'd come back, I'd go out on a Friday night shift and he'd sort of take over. So it, it did work in that sense. Um, yeah. What about resourcing in hospitals? So what about bed shortages and things like that um, during your time when you were there? Did you experience any of that over, that, over those 15 years? Yeah, so that's that was another, just another common thing. There was never any beds. Um, that was just always, there's no beds. And it was it was very much right. We need to, we'd, we'd get managers that would come up to the ward and they'd be like, right, we need to move these people out. Um, who can go home? Um, because we've got people in A&E who've been there X amount of time. Can we move this person? Is this person okay? And like, well, this person is kind of ready. This person is ready to go. And they're like, right, what's stopping them from going home? So there'd be other people doing that. And then they get onto us like, right, what are the treatments that they need or what needs doing for them to go home? Um, but the, I think the issues, again, are the, the ones in the... And um, sort of like getting care packages in place because that's apparently like a separate funding issue with like local councils. So there's issues there. Um, oh, so what? So discharging a patient needs to go home and needs continued care. Uh-huh. Yeah. So yeah. So they they call them. It's not like get called bed blockers. So they're fit for discharge, um, but they can't go home because they haven't got a care package in place yet. Give me an example of a care package you were talking about, like a common one. So it would be, so somebody can go back to their own home, for example, but they now need assistance because of whatever it's, so they might need carers to come in like three times a day, um, you know, to to get them out of bed, to wash them, to dress them, to do the meals. Um, And they might also need things in place in the home. It's like safety things, you know, like frames, things to go over the toilet so they don't have to like you know fix they might need to be a little bit higher because they can't get all the way down or bars either side um you know because they're not as mobile around the house just loads of things like that that might need doing and that needs you know involvement from like physios occupational therapists um so it's like a it's it's quite a lot to you know a lot of planning for some people to to get them home um and that's council funded so the so yeah so going into care homes and things like that that and getting them packages in place have is sort of like funded by local councils and apparently i haven't looked into i can't go into too much detail because i haven't looked too much into detail and about their funding but i just you know i've read that there's issues there as well. Yeah, that presents an issue to go and involve local council trying to get funding from them for anything, right? And um, even if it wasn't local council, it's another organisation you have to re- rely on to do it. You know, um, what's the general feeling on the ground from uh, from what you've heard in terms of how much difference uh, a pay increase would make? Um, I. I've been following some of the strike stuff, so I think, uh, to me, I think it's it's more t- to do with, I think, like, like showing that, for, like, that they're appre- appreciated. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Because, um, I mean, I can't really relate to the pay thing because when I, I was also paid mostly by the army and I was quite comfortable and happy with that. And um, so I can't really relate to their pay struggles because when we worked in the hospitals, we were always, you know, paid a lot more than civilian nurses. Um, so I, I kind of knew what their pay was. And I knew that when I left, I would take a big pay drop, which is why I did age, I did sign up for agency and I was, it was to top up the pay that I was I was used to essentially. So I was working Monday to Friday, um, doing a band six job, which was a sister. And then I was topping up that money by doing agency the odd agency shifts on weekends. 
Um, so, but for me, for like, when we talk about nurses leaving, so one of the issues is retention. And um, I think there's like a third that are leaving now and there wasn't a lot of detail on why they left. It was just, it just said work-life balance was one of the reasons. I think 40% was, um, was retirement, so which can't really be helped. But then a big chunk was work-life balance. Um, and for me, like when I decided I wasn't going back, it, it had nothing to do with pay because if, um, say if I could, if I could still do the agency, I was getting quite a lot of money. So, and I, and I still wasn't going, wanting to go to certain shifts. Like one was, the, <laughs> one was enough. Like I was walking and I was like, oh, like I can't keep doing this. Um, especially when I was pregnant as well. Um, it's just one of the, I'd always like, it become the norm to like not have breaks and to just like be on your feet constantly. That was just, I could do that. But one, when I was pregnant, um, I was a bit like, I'm not doing this, you know, my, I'm not doing this for like my unborn child. Um, you, you know, I'm being like refused a break when I felt that's just not on. I'm not accepting that anymore. Um, so it wasn't, for me, it wasn't really, the pay issue it was all the other issues um like and i know this isn't just with nurses i know like doctors experience this as well but there is a bit of like a like a toxic culture where there's there's a bit of a blame culture that goes on and it's in what regard what do you mean um so for when i started training i feel like it's it's drilled into you that if if you make it because you have a, a pin registration it's drilled into you from like day one if, if you do this you lose your pin if you do this you'll lose your pin if you do this someone might die if you do this you might go to prison and it's just this it's like almost like this constant fear that's put in put into you that you've got to be really rigid with your practice which in, in one sense that was a good thing because i'd, I'd like nursing because it was very black and white it was this is the way you do something and there's no deviation from that. You don't cut corners, um, you know, because someone's like life could be at risk. You just you, you do things by the book, by the policy. This is how they're done. And I liked that. Um, but then there's this there was a bit of a being like quite scared then that you might make a mistake or if you do make a mistake to speak out and then managers probably maybe on like people's backs overly checking things being a bit um micromanaging yeah micromanaging a lot um which i experienced in quite a lot of areas yeah a lot of micromanaging um which then just causes issues and doesn't make it a very nice place to work well micromanaging is quite common i mean <laughs> it's quite common in organizations like the nhs where they're, they're running lean all the time so uh, I, in my in my understanding, anyway. So you know, like the NHS is as an example, because they're always they, they're never going to run to a well with the pandemic aside. In some instances, there they're never going to run where they got loads of beds free, right? Uh, because money, because the government funded, and because it's just not the way it runs. <clears throat> but uh, but overall, you I mean, you were saying earlier there was always a shortage of beds. It may not have meant that. The overall number of beds wasn't fluctuating, wasn't increasing or, de or you know, decreasing maybe. But um, but in those organisations that run lean are always being forced to try to cut costs primary, uh, without cutting corners, for example, because pe people might die up or, and, and or lawsuits and things like that, you know. People, lives maybe change for the worse because of someone's mistake or, or um, you know, an employee, a, a, a nurse or a doctor would be pressured to do X, Y, Z within a, a certain time frame and got it wrong. But in those situations where there's very little margin to change the actual processes of the actual service you're supposed to deliver, in this case, healthcare, then uh, you, 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 you get, unfortunately, um, you get unfortunately large, uh, large pockets of like middle management and, and lower management will do that micromanaging because it's all, almost like a a way to try and find a reason why they're not why they're why they're underperforming 
or why they're yeah, underperforming in terms of meeting meeting uh, service like service levels or cost. You know, I'm not saying it's right. Yeah. So it's quite common. It's, it's crap. The, the interesting about the NHS as well, it reminds me a little bit like the military, right? And you you you'll know this because you've been in both worlds I have. Okay, and and that is that um, it's an organisation where it's very the people who are there and work within it. I feel more emotionally attached to that industry or that profession than they would in any other, like than they would if they were a bricklayer, right? And it, and so it's more emotionally driven. And so in those situations, we've got a large number of staff who are like that, and like in the military too. And it's all about teamwork. It's all about just getting it done. It's all about we've got to, you know, we're saving lives or we're, we're preventing dramas. It's very very easy to uh, one for a culture to move to in towards like. So aspects which would be which become toxic, toxic, counterproductive, and two very easy to exploit, like consciously or or, or not exploit um, workers, nurses, doctors to do what they shouldn't have to do. One of the things I was I was I was listening to recently, and he was we were talking specifically about GPs and the way GPs' attitudes have changed as well uh, over the last few years, in a similar way where you are you were experiencing a few uh, you were describing a few minutes ago in that uh, unwillingness to do more than what they should do so now more and more gps are saying no i'm working for my contract states and i'm not doing a hundred hour a hundred hour week when i'm getting paid tuppence for the extra hours and it's destroying my work work you know per, uh, my family my my personal and professional work routine and my work life balance yeah. and so uh, they're sticking to the guns on on the contract side of things and that's reducing the amount of care that can be provided and you, you can't help but say well why why wouldn't they good like good on them i mean but it's also a product that has been allowed to go on for so long that this exploitation's happened in a way and i, I mean I'm, the exploitation might be a bit strong on word but also it's probably not in some instances it's allowed, been allowed to go on for so, so long that it's just expe- it's just expected now and it sounds to me like healthcare professionals are putting their feet down and saying no more yeah yeah, and I think now it sounds like because um, a lot that I'm seeing being shared as well is is how now it's impacting on um, healthcare workers, uh, physical and mental health now um, to the point where there's I think there was a recent study um, that said like thirty percent of, of of NHS you know the professionals in that study that they did were you know suicidal or having suicidal thoughts um and i have heard um and i have spoke to one nurse um who have ex- experienced like ptsd from the pandemic and they're not they're not getting the support and sort of like care that they need and it's just a bit like you shouldn't you shouldn't go to work and work shouldn't make you sick. Like, especially in a role where you're supposed to be there to make people better, that shouldn't be making you sick. Um, and that's why I think a lot of people leave because it gets to the point where they're like, this is going to impact on my health now. Um, so I can't, I can't do this anymore. Um, but yeah, in terms of like, what's about the managers, I think, think there's a lot of pressure on them from the top as well and to meet targets um and then that that sort of like trickles down because then they put pressure on the staff um just thinking of like you know one example this was like when I was working at any agency and this was in my mind when I was like oh I'm not I'm not coming back here like this is horrendous and it was like the managers were put I was the only nurse on a side so you get allocated say side or set amount of patients and usually you would get at least one healthcare assistant to help you out but there was a healthcare assistant sort of covering like two sides and so I basically didn't see her at all it was just me on my own and then because um resource was full a patient that was supposed to be in resource so that's like you know like high-end care needs more sort of like one-on-one work was in my department it was in majors which is sort of like a little bit less sick and um, so I was looking after a research patient and then f- trying to look after five other patients 
but this resource patient needed one-on-one -on -one care so i was in and out in and out so it meant the other patients i barely got to see them and one of them was um mental health patient and um, that i didn't even know being put in there because they'd just been put in a cubicle i was taking care of this resource patient didn't even know they were there they absconded from the department so there was a whole incident that was flagged up about that um and it's just that's like that's quite a common scenario that would be a common scenario <laughs> for some days um and that that's just an you know example and then because of in that department as well i think some senior managers had been sacked because of some incidents that had occurred because of all these things so then they felt a huge amount of pressure and um, that the same would happen to them so they were trying to prevent incidents but they were kind of like making it worse because all the staff i was talking to the staff on my break and i remember i'd i was pregnant at the time so everything made me cry so um, uh -huh. I, did, <laughs> I did get uh, yeah i did get upset um because you know the the one of the managers had been quite snappy with me um and then they said don't worry it, it, we all hate it here um everybody feels the same um and that for like yeah a bad department that is unfortunately like quite common so now i'm trying to think well what's it like now now that there's not just people in the corridors and ambulances back up there's people in car parks as well like i can't even imagine how horrendous that must be yeah i mean the only the only like light at the end of the immediate short term light at the end of the tunnel at the minute is we're getting towards spring <laughs> You know, and that's going to relieve some pressure on uh, relieve some pressure on 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 the uh, on the health service. But I would hate for that to result in the spotlight being taken off it, because you know, from from what I read and listened to, from what you've been saying, and it just sounds like that in ev every single aspect of of what provides the health service from resources available to finances available for x y z to um you know the care packages available the the tree triage and the, the level of staff available the quality of management and and don't want to like carefully lay blame on managers saying shit no it's not like i wasn't i wasn't saying that earlier on it's like everything is bad because everything is bad yeah yeah because <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't want to, yeah, like you said, direct too much at the managers because I'm aware that they have an immense amount of pressure. Yeah. They have targets to meet. They have people above them saying you need to do X, Y, and Z. So I understand that they have an immense amount of pressure. And like the way I think of it now is this is this is like an everyone issue. Like this is this is a problem for everyone now because it's not. It's also. Um, you know the people going into a &E as well and there's been campaigns for quite some time now about um where's appropriate to go whether you need to you know you can go to your pharmacy you, that can be used um as well as your gp i know people say you can't get appointments but you you can in terms of you know when people some people tip up to a &E and it's like they're coming in for something minor that the gp could shout out like like back pain and you say, well, why haven't you been to your doctors? And like, oh, I can never get an appointment. And it's, but it's just been going on for about a year now. And I just thought I'd sort it out today because I've got some spare time. And it, it's little things like that. Um, and I know some departments would have a GP attached. So they would say, right, OK, I'm going to refer you to the GP. Or some might even phone their doctors and say, I've made you an appointment. You've got one next week. Um, it's little things like that that compound it as well. It's and obviously if we're um, we're getting sicker as well, um, like chronic illnesses are increasing and we're not living longer anymore. Like that's starting to go backwards. Um, are you sure? I thought it was still increasing. No, it's going backwards. Don't tell me that. <laughs> Literally, I just I've not long turned forty. I'm forty one now, and I've been getting miserable about it. Okay, it's all right. You're only halfway through your life. You're only half. You got loads left. Now you're telling me, maybe not. Well, well, not 
No, I mean, not you specifically. I mean, if you look at if you look at the the top like chronic illnesses, like the you know like heart disease, diabetes, things like that, um, they're like eighty percent preventable. Um, so I think a a lot of it is down to like lifestyle choice that you know. People... But one of the reasons for those dis- having more of those diseases around though is because we're living longer. It is because we're living longer. Because you get older, you get more. I'm, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying. It's also lifestyle. But as we have an age, as we we're basically able to be kept alive longer because <laughs> medicine's getting better, which means we're living with these illnesses. Not we live. People are living with these illnesses just before they were dying, right? Yeah. Well, be- so before it was as well. It was um, there was a lot of like obviously infectious illnesses. I think the average, like if we're going back way way back, the average age was like in you in your 30s wasn't it your 30s 40s and now it's 70s um and but i i do think a big thing is 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 like lifestyle if you look at the number one killer it's heart disease and it's a like heart disease is 80 percent preventable and the things that cause heart disease are <coughs> is the way that we live currently you know it's smoking alcohol diet lack of exercise stress yeah so. but one of the interesting things that not interesting one of the things that frustrated me was it last week the week before where i can't remember which minister it was it said something like do less contact sports and go out in your car less because you don't overwhelm the nhs with like having an accident or whatever and I, and I was thinking that that is not that is not the message like it it's the same it's the same problem they did the, the same bullshit they did in, in they i'm talking about government that they did in uh, during the pandemic it to reinforce what you were saying there. It's like you should be saying, like right now, eat healthier, get a little bit more active on a daily basis, cut down on consuming things that are bad for you. And and that will have a net impact on the number of people going and, and, and needing a health service because it's going to be generally healthier. I mean, can you imagine, right? And some of the mental, on the mental health thing, can you imagine now if it was like made law? <laughs> well, maybe it was an all-made law, but if everyone decided we're going to go out for an hour walk every day, it's not everyone's going to happen. Imagine it happened. The whole, whole, the whole of the UK started doing it. I guarantee you, there'd be less people in a week's time looking for uh, needing the health service than it was the week before it started. They started yeah. doing it. One hundred percent guaranteed. Guaranteed. Everyone needs to stop drinking alcohol for for a month. It's January, but never stop. Stop drinking alcohol. So I like, it'll be two months. Away. Minimal, like the impact on the health service would be huge. Would be yeah. huge, you know. And and we sh- and we were, they weren't saying during the pandemic either. And it, and it's a key message that needs to be uh, communicated. If you want if you want to fucking take the pressure off the health service. If you want if you you know if you if you feel compassion and and uh, and empathy for the nurses and the doctors and the and the healthcare professionals who are like going to strike and are finding it really hard, then uh, then start looking after yourself more. You know what I mean? And this is one of the issues where I know we, we talked a couple of weeks ago very briefly about like potential privatization. And it's one of the issues with privatization. Like uh, that, that messaging is minimal now, and it'll go out the window if, that, if something like that happens. I mean, what what is that much of a conversation with anyone uh, in your healthcare circles about privatization? No, I mean I haven't when I was working, I I don't really remember it coming up in conversation much. Um, I do remember there was in one of the ANEs, there was an element of it already with um, sort of like the people who worked on reception were virgin. Um, but I don't really understand, understand how that worked. Oh, and they were the ones that were actually, that was the, they were the ones who would make the appointments for the um, GPs. They sort of yeah. took over that and would say, right, if you don't, need to be here we can get you an appointment with your gp but that i only saw that in one um hospital that i worked but it didn't no i've from my experience anyway it's not it's not really propped up that much um we just have i just have like you know like personal opinions like what we talked about about whether whether or not it would work and um i think it was i was chatting to claire about in a podcast as well where the only the only pro I could think of if, if it was to be privatised was um, was that if, you know, if something's free, people don't tend to value it as much. 
Um, I know that definitely happens like sort of in the business area. People people talk a lot about having free stuff, but I'm like, actually, like when I've given out free stuff, it's people don't value it. So if if something I'm not saying it should go private, by the way, but my only thinking was if something has a price tag and you have to pay for it, people might value it a little bit more. And they might also you mean they'll it. think twice about going to get it. Do I actually need it? Do I need to take this resource? They'll think twice about whether they need it or not. Is that, what you, is that the point you make it? Yeah. And also you, you could you could pay for better care as well. Um, but then that but then what would come into that is then there would be um, you know, the, there'd just be inequalities and because then, you know, you could only get better health care then if you're more well off. Um but you can pay for very, it now for private health. Yeah, no, I know you keep private healthcare now, but not with, as far as I'm aware, because this is what I was thinking, there isn't any accident emergencies that are, are private healthcare, because I know that people say, oh, I've, I'm okay, I've got private healthcare, and I'm like, well, if you had a heart attack, where would you go? I think you'd go to accident emergency. Yeah. I, I, I'm not aware, and I've asked, I've, I've asked around, I'm not aware there's any private accident and emergencies. And I, I did try and find some, and I don't think there is any. So if you have an accident or emergency, you'll still be going into the NHS yeah. system. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know my thoughts on it. I think it's a, a nightmare, scenario, nightmare scenario, but I, I do think it's one of the ways we're moving. It's going to be, it's going to be around, you know. Um, I mean, I mean, right now, it, ju it just, it needs, I think the first thing needs to happen is, I, I think, a, a massive pay increase. A, a big pay, not some nominal bullshit figure. Like a massive pay increase for the NHS across the board, across the board, I think should happen. I yeah. wanted to, to demonstrate to demonstrate intent. Uh, two, to make it a more attractive place to go and work and and and, and take the attraction away from the agencies. So we have, you know, we have the we have skilled people in, in, engaged for long periods within the NHS, not, not agency working. Take some power away from the agencies as well. Then. And then uh, uh yeah because I, I think retention is is one of the areas they're not looking at it's like if you're hemorrhaging staff because and i did see a consultant talking about this actually and he was saying they make promises of oh we'll, we're going to backfill we're going to or even bring people in from a bar broad to fill the numbers and so oh, we're going to bring in like <coughs> six, six thousand doctors okay but if you a year if you're losing six thousand doctors a year to go work abroad you're not you're not really solving the problem you have to you have to not just bring extra staff in you have to work on retaining the staff you've got and pay is one of the ways that you can do that um there's all the other issues mentioned but pay is definitely a way to do that because well, the I other thing with pay, so, sorry the other thing with with the pay that i was going to say there is when you if you think it, I think it can be done quickly like it's, it's one of the things they could literally enact in a month or two months' time, we can just do it and have to pay. So it's it's not it's not it's not a difficult thing to implement. Right? Um, whereas like increasing infrastructure is, um, and, but one of the things with increasing pay, it's like it, you would make the workforce happier. I mean, yeah. you're going to happen the workforce; they're more productive, and just them being more productive would, would have like an indirect impact on the on the the strain on the NHS. Well, yeah, you, you, you know that. You like when I'm miserable, I don't work very well. I'm not happy. I work really well, and I want to do more for my employer. And the customers getting a better get a, getting a better service for you, whoever the customer is, internal or external. You know? um, but uh, yeah, I jumped in there. Sorry, what were you going to say? Yeah, um, no, that, no. You just made me think. Actually, so, yeah. So one of the things I've I have always thought is it, it comes down to the um, you know you can't pour from an empty cup. Um, you know you've got to you've got to take care of yourself first. So. And I found this with, so with, with the nursing, it's always been patient first, patient first, patient first. And, and then with the military, it was like, you know, the military comes first, you, you come across second, the same yeah. sort the same sort of message. And, and I think, I don't know if some people take that as just forget yourself. Um, and, and, and I, f I feel like it's more like a cycle as in, you know, you've kind of got to, put yourself first but that doesn't mean put yourself first forget about everybody else it's like no you've got to you've got to fill up your own cup and make sure all your own needs are met because 
that's what makes you a better person slash nurse um and and we know that through nursing anyway we've they've done sort of like <sighs> tests or you know when nurses are tired it's one of the reasons why um, they would stop doing the night nurses doing the morning drug rounds because more ep drug errors occurred because they were more tired. Um, so it's things like, yeah, they've, they've got to start taking more care of themselves. And yeah, uh, it's easy to say, though. I mean, it's, I know. <laughs> it's easy to apply in an industry like, you know, where I work. I work at SATCOMs. So I'm not saying that it was like, well. Some, some of our equipment saves people's lives at sea, right? But I'm not, you know, I'm not hands-on saving people's lives, right? And, and so it's a different kind of fish. I know how to manage my work-life balance. I don't get thrown some extra work on a Friday or any day at 5 p.m. As, as I'm about to knock off. I think, oh, my God, I can't stop. It's going to take three hours, but I can't. Oh, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to, I'm going to do it. No, I don't do that. I don't. An extremist, unless it's, like, time-sensitive, you know. But... In the health, well, you know, in the health service, man, if it's a choice between knocking off and uh, knocking off now, and potentially someone isn't getting the care you think they should get because you know that the next shift coming on, they're down people too, like you've been all day. And little Mrs. Miggins, who's just coming to the ward, she's not very well and she needs all the care she can get. You're going to do it, aren't you? It's just, it's human nature, you know, it's human nature. And it's, and it's even more so, it's, uh, it's, even, and it's even more so in, in, we talked about like overwhelmingly in the in the health profession is you know for, uh, are women, and women are are more more caring, kinder people on general than, than men are. It's a fact. It's a fact, and and so uh, and so that's why that exists. You can't you know when I think about the current situation, all of all, everyone is in the health service now, and they're still there, and they've and they've. But well, you talked about it since two thousand two. You know it was bad. It was bad then. This is just kind of the general way it exists and I mentioned about like the, the lean method of operating but now it's like horrendous and they're still there you know the, the kind of people that are doing that job they should get a pay rise just for that you know what I mean get yeah. A pay rise just for that. yeah definitely um because yeah well think about the one of the reasons I stayed in the army so long was the pay <laughs> and that's what kept me um yeah. and, yeah. <laughs> and it it was like a it was like a real sort of like push breaking point for me to leave but i was always yeah i was always coaxed in by the pay to stay otherwise if it had been less i might have left there sooner so i think i think pay would definitely help because um well i'll say it coaxed people to stay longer but they still obviously need to fix all the other issues um that are just compound yeah at the but the, the, those issues will compound right if the yeah that me doesn't matter you could go and you, you know, you could you could go and change a lot of things now if you could, but if the workforce isn't happy, it, 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 it has a, a marginal effect. And, and back to the point, I think it's the quickest thing I can do. You know, yeah. I, I have got a real fear that they want to try and privatise. I mean, it's certainly the way we should go. The thing is, with privatisation, yeah. it's, it's bad, 95% bad. There's very few good things, like there's one or two good things about it. I think you mentioned both of them. Uh, but what it does do is it makes people very rich at the expense of, at the, expense of the general population, you know. Yeah. Um, up to America for that example it's a fucking nightmare it's a fucking nightmare yeah uh, and, you know and the other side is we, we do the Joe Public here do sometimes take it for granted you know I, I've certainly over the last year last it was last year at some point last year and I, I said to my missus I, 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 I had some it's so wrong with me I couldn't what it was and I uh, couldn't get a doctor's appointment for 10 days that was just a phone call that's the way the GP is for me isn't it? My, my surgery if I book an appointment I mean back to the point about people grafting if I go to book an appointment it's an online system booking it's only phone consultations right and it mm. doesn't matter what you could pick a 10 minute slot I know I'm, I'm not going to get that 10 minute slot I'm probably not even going to get a call on that day I know that because I've done it three or four times over the last two years but I will get a call from my GP it, the last one I had I said to Kit I said, I said to her I said, I, my GP called at 6 p.m. on a Friday. It was 6 p.m. on a Friday. I said, what? The call should be on a Wednesday. It's something like 1.30 p.m. And she yeah. called me on, it was 6.30, I think it was. I think it was 6.30. I had a pint somewhere. 6.30, I got a call from my GP. No way she would. The surgery isn't open at 6.30 yeah, it's p.m. Not open. Right? It's not. And yet she is calling round 
doing catching up the calls that she should i mean should, should the case in point that people grasped it because they were under pressure yeah i was just saying that that's what people don't appreciate they some people do tend to complain a lot um about things like they, you know they might say oh, well i couldn't get an appointment and they didn't phone me till friday and then it, i think it is it's um yeah just having a little bit of understanding and like compassion for what they might be going through like you thought there well actually they're not open at that time on a friday so they're working in their own time to catch up on all the people and yeah and i know i know how stressed they will be and how much pressure they'll feel to catch up on that list before they finish and she phoned you at six o'clock she might have still oh they might have still been doing calls to like 10 o'clock at night you don't know um the, the point I was, I was making before I cut myself off and went, went on a tangent was that I was going to go for something else. I couldn't get an appointment. Well, I didn't want to, I didn't, couldn't get one quick enough. It's all I wanted. But I felt I wanted. And I was going to go to A&E. A &E. I, I was, I was at uh, home, said to, said to Kate, I'm going to go, gonna, I think I'll go to A&E. She's like, mm. why? Why? It's not an accident. It's not an emergency. You've got no need to go. There's no need to go there. But the reason I was going to go, because it's that mindset, which I think a lot of people have, and I certainly don't have anymore until she pollocked was that, ah, oh, doctor's appointment in 10 days, or I can pop along to A&E, &E, go in there, get triaged. Yeah, it's maybe four, five, six hour away, depending on yeah. where you are. But I'll get seen today. But I'll still get seen completely today. Selfish, completely selfish, yeah. completely selfish. And I think from, from with me, it, was, it wasn't selfish, it was a misunderstanding meaning of what A&E is for, which is really what it was. So yeah. I, know, I think twice. <laughs> I don't want her wrath on me anyway. But yeah, you know, it was a really good point. But, but I, yeah, no, that does make me think actually if that is that is like a a problem with our current culture at the minute. And not not to do with healthcare, but just this needing it needing it now. Um like I know with um, you know, just ordering stuff as well. It's like oh just anything, it has to be now. And if if it's something like now is oh this will arrive in like five days, I'm like, no, I want it tomorrow. Um <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and I know that I know a lot of people who feel that way as well. I'm just wondering if that if everything's speeding up in society, whether that's compounding on it as well. That it's like, well, no, I've got an issue. I want it. Res I should be able to get it resolved now. You know, we we have um, an advanced healthcare system and this that. Yeah. So I should be able to get this issue solved right away. And if I can't, I'll get it solved today. I'm not going to wait ten days for an appointment. Definitely. Definitely, that has to be a factor in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, <laughs> has to be. I'm the same. I, when I order, I order on Amazon quite often, and I always want it today because you can get it if you order earlier. If it come by 10 p.m. today, depending on what it is, or I want it tomorrow for no rational reason other than yeah, as soon as possible, please. Like I pay yeah. for Amazon Prime. There's probably no need to pay for Amazon Prime. I don't yeah. need everything now. I don't need everything. No, I know <laughs> it's it's crazy. I, like I'm aware of it as well. Like I. And I almost like don't want to feed into that, but sometimes I can't help myself. I see the two <laughs> options, and especially if one's cheaper as well, which often, well, like so if I'm it often is, I'm like, well, it's cheaper and I can get it tomorrow. It's the most logical yeah. option. I'm going to go for that option. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, yeah, I was just wondering if people make them same decision points in the head, like, oh, I have a former GP. He's telling me I've got back pain. He's telling me it's going to be 10 days. Well, I could go sit in a and &E, it'd be six hours to see a doctor, but I'll still see someone that day. I, I can see that rationale, actually. Um, I've probably never thought of it that way before. Uh, just mm. as an A&E &E nurse, it would just be quite annoying um, because, you know, then there's like 100 people in the department and only sort of 10 of them are actually emergencies. Another, uh, do you want another, another potential... Uh, way to reduce the strain at the minute and long term anyway would be, would be an increase in the telemedicine services definitely you know and in, so one an increase in, in the telemedicine services and two an increase in the people willing to use it you know what i mean yeah so we're talking about district nurses reduction in them but if you could do if you could do like straight away well triple one is is it now isn't it triple one you can ring up and go yeah i'm, I'm not yeah. very well and and but I think, isn't there quite a waiting time on that at the moment? I'm not sure. I don't have any idea about that. But um, I was looking at nurse triage jobs, actually, for 111 as, as a potential job, because I could do that from home. Um, 
but I've no idea about how that works as you know as a system or whether that I'd have to like yeah work in it or not so I'm working in it to see whether um that would work or not I don't know and like you say what the waiting times I, I I've heard a little bit on you know the grapevine that they just you just get directed to a and &E. um but I haven't heard much more other than that mm. Um, because I think the difficulty, just thinking from my perspective as a nurse, the difficulty would be um assessing someone without without seeing them in person. Um and again, it's it would be that whole right, if this person is if if I don't diagnose this person right or give them the right um advice and they die at home, is that gonna come back on me? Um so there would be this probably more of an inclination to say if there's a slight worry, okay, go to a &E. Um Well, that's always the caveat. And that's what's done now, though. It's no different. That's what's done now. You know, it's, no, it's no different. It's just sort of increasing it, increasing people using it. I rarely use one. I, I, not, I've never used it for myself. I'm pretty sure I've never used it for myself. I've used it for the kids. I've never used it for myself. I might have to change that. But, um, yeah, well, it's a good discussion, isn't it? But to be honest, I sit on the fence with a lot of issues like this because it take like they seem so complex, you know, and it's yeah. so and it can be so divisive. It's, it's almost like on a stick man and someone would go, no, 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 it doesn't exist. It's all right, it's fine. Nothing's going to work out. But I'm glad we had this because it's forced me to look at uh, uh, do some research on it um, this uh, uh, this weekend. And then on the, I was I was I was driving for a few hours yesterday, and then I I, I just searched NHS on Spotify and listened to a lot of podcasts about the NHS mm -hmm. on the way up as well, uh, which were really informative. And just I I do think now from from listening to stuff and talk to you, it's like just first thing is give them a fucking pay rise. And yeah. We just, we just resolve a lot of things straight away. We certainly really reduce the immediate pressure. And don't and, just. Google nurse pay and then go, oh, well, they get like 30, okay, yeah, they're all right. Because that's that's been an average that's worked out. That's not like the majority of... The majority of nurses that would, would make up a, a band five nurses and um, after sort of like tax, you know, national insurance pensions, uh, yeah. for uh, parking, it's... Yeah. It, uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, regardless of that average, like, give up, give every NHS employee a pay rise across the board. Fucking do it, regardless of where they are. On the yeah, because it's not. It's just um, it's doctors as because I can only speak on sort of behalf of nurses, but I follow a lot of doctors as well, and they're saying similar yeah. things. Especially, yeah. uh, I think junior doctors are looking at striking now because yeah. their, it, their pay doesn't equate to the amount of hours. It also, skill it'll also reduce the reliance on. Uh, also reduce the reliance on agencies, which is just a spend that isn't. Yeah. Just, not needed yeah because because one of the arguments i always see crop up is um oh well there's no money and i'm like but they're spending like three thousand pound a night on agency nurses i think i, I did the maths on one night shift the and i was like a three thousand pound is a is a month well it's not that's more than a monthly wage for one staff nurse you could get a staff nurse for an entire month and they're spending that on one night shift the problem is it comes from a different pot. This is the thing. Yeah. It's like I've seen the same in, the, in you know in, in the corporate world. It's like willingness to spend on an agency worker or a contractor for sometimes like a couple of years, as opposed to bringing on an employee for a couple of years, because they may have a because they may have a um, they may have, may have a staffing cap. They may only be I'm just pulling numbers out here. They may only uh, be allowed to have a hundred people on paper, or they may only allow to spend X amount on wages on paper for over over the next two years but they when you pay for a, an agency worker it comes out of a different pot it doesn't come out of the salary pot it comes out of like like capex capital spending pot so it's all yeah. smokes and mirrors and numbers and, and so it I'm, looks I'm not, like yeah i'm not sure how it works on I'm not sure. those numbers within that salary cap but actually it's costing more so it's all smokes and mirrors fucking annoying i'm not sure it works within departments now i know the one where they did tell me a little bit about the finances was they were using it they were using the pay that would be used for a you know 
a nurse, a full-time nurse for agency. I don't know if they still do that now. Um, but the, the, that one department I worked in where they were paying like £3,000 a night for a night shift, um, they were, I think they were like 17 nurses short, they said. So it was, they were, it was just that they couldn't get enough people in. Um, to keep them and I um, don't know if they had a retention problem but there was a newly qualified nurse on there and I came on to her crying um, and she said she was thinking of leaving already she'd only been there six months so I'm like like you say it's, it's all these complex issues there's not one there's not one problem there's so many problems um, that all need tackling like yeah. there be a short term they say short term would be increase the pay that's where we make a start and then long term, we need to tackle all these other issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Um, we have to wrap it up. So, for people who are unaware, tell us about your podcast that you and uh, you and Claire on. Yeah, so it's um, it's called Just a Mum podcast, and um, I we've got a Just a Mum podcast page. I'm on Just a Mum doing everything. <laughs> um that's on instagram and yeah we're updating the podcast about monthly at the minute just because our workloads increase so we're just trying to we try to get on at least once a month um and we have spoke recently about the sort of like the nhs crisis as well oh good so so more, you, more yeah 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 and yeah we do plan to cover it in a bit more depth but i'm doing a little bit more research so because <laughs> I, I know my um I might need to get a little bit up to date because I only know, you know, what people are telling me and things pre-pandemic. I need to look into the actual stats of things and what have you. Cool. I'll put a link to the podcast in the, the blurb of this. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. We're done. It's been nice. Nice speaking. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Thank you for watching the H Hour podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast and you haven't already done so, please subscribe here around about there. I'm hoping it's around about there where the button's going to appear. If not, if it's not already appeared, uh, you can also, um, if you want to listen to the podcast on your commute, for example, when you're driving, when it's not practical to watch the podcast, you can listen to it. It's on Spotify. It's on Apple Podcasts. It's on Google Podcasts. It's everywhere. It's on all of the uh, all of the common and not so common podcast apps. You can also, if you wish to do it, become a patron of H-Hour. Becoming a patron of H-Hour, you get access to all of the interviews before anyone else. So this interview with this guest was released days, if not weeks, before it was on release to the general public. And you also get access to uh, exclusive interviews, which I do with each guest, that last about five, ten minutes, that are based on questions that the patrons themselves of H-Hour have chosen. And each guest, this one included, gets asked those questions before the main podcast starts getting recorded. It's like a pre-podcast interview, lasts about 10 minutes. And those interviews are really insightful, really enjoyable, nice and short, and they only release to patrons. They never get released to the public. I don't know why I had a little stutter there. Um, you also get access to... A Discord community, exclusive Discord community only for patrons. You also get invited to a monthly Zoom call with myself and all the other patrons. And very often, most months, we have a previous podcast guest comes onto that Zoom call and has an exclusive Q&A with the patrons. In addition to this, there's monthly giveaways. We give away, give away gifts to my patron supporters. And it's all like, well, predominantly veteran-owned stuff. I'll go and buy veteran-owned apparel, veteran-owned product services, and I'll give them away to my patron supporters. And I'll also uh, do exclusive invites for events. So you'll get freebie tickets to events. To become a patron of H-Hour, go to patreon.com forward slash HK podcast. I'm spelling Patreon, P A T R E O N, patreon.com forward slash HK podcasts. Hit become a patron. And uh, I'll see you on the next Zoom, Q Zoom QA if you do. Oh, you also get your name in the credits. Thanks for watching. I will catch you next time.